you everybody for coming and thanks Mark for the uh, startup. Um, my name is Dave Bryan and uh, I'm a mechanical engineer. I work out of Butte, a company that is just one of me, so my company is myself, um, but it's uh, Balance Engineering LLC. And um, what I do is energy conservation on farms primarily. And uh, I also do large wind uh, pre-development. So um, that's my major areas of work. There we go. Okay, so um, I, I work with uh, on-farm on energy use. Um, I deal with NRCS programs, uh, environmental quality uh, incentives program, okay and uh, CSP, which is a Conservation Security Program. So if you're farmers and you deal with those kind of uh, programs, then you uh, want to uh, get help with uh, on-farm energy use, uh, that, that's a plug for those programs. So in short, uh, we buy the carbon that we admit to the atmosphere. So you know, we are actually paying for the stuff that we're polluting ourselves with. And that's not just carbon, but that's all kinds of pollutants uh, from fossil fuels. Uh, there's a list of the fuels that um, I, I pick on. Uh, there's all kinds of different fuels. Uh, most of these uh, we use. 80% of the fuel use in the United States comes from fossil fuels. So uh, we're burning stuff that was uh, a legacy from millions of years ago. And that's what the problem is. So. Um, in, in all the years I've been working in energy conservation and renewables, uh, which is getting close to 30, um, I can distill this down into two things. Okay? Uh, what we can do to uh, decrease our, our carbon emissions is one, we can invest in more efficient equipment. So we are not going to uh, burn as much fuel in a given amount of time as we did before. There's all kinds of ways we can do that, and that's where the devil's in the details. Okay, the other thing we can do is we decrease the amount of time that we use that equipment. So those are the two things okay, that we can do uh, that are easy, cost-effective, very incremental. So don't hold up because you say, oh God, I can't afford to do this, because you can do it one little piece at a time. How do we eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So we can do this very incremental. Um, the other thing that we can do finally is make our own fuel. So the things that we know uh, most about is solar electric, uh, wind electric, okay, so we are making our own fuel. We can also replace liquid fuels. Uh, we can make our own alcohol, we can make our own diesel. Uh, these take effort and uh, a little bit of uh, self-determination, but these can be done. So. That's my spiel. I think I'm done. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. Uh, could you pass it over to Patty? Hey, I'm uh, Patty Armbruster. I live in eastern Montana over on High Island uh, at Hensdale School. I teach at the school there, I teach agriculture. But I've been in agriculture my whole life, born in Michigan on a farm in. Um, just crazy about the cattle business and spent most of my younger years in the cattle business and uh, was lucky enough to, to work on a ranch in New York that allowed me to travel close to the lower 48 in the cattle business. So I got to see a lot of agriculture um, through that time period. But uh, I've been very, very interested in not only the energy part of this regenerative um, growing, but also the regenerating of the soils and regenerating of the people. So, but for this part of this topic, I'm going to talk about these. Uh, this is a passive solar greenhouse that we built at the Hinsdale School with a bunch of students. And so, when I first started working there, when I have a greenhouse to be able to teach kids how to grow food, and I thought, well, there's no way in the world they're going to let me do that because of the energy bill. And I already knew that because there was a, a greenhouse already bought with grant money that they never constructed because they wouldn't pass the energy bill. Deal. So I'm like, okay. So I researched, found this passive solar design. This one is um, kind of followed off of a 
Missouri State Extension for their size and scale and built our own with the students at Trevay Road Grants. So, so very simple greenhouse, all, all passive, so there is no energy built with this greenhouse, just the construction of it. And then uh, I started working with these people at the Sleeping Buffalo. They're a hot spring in Seiko, Montana, so they have a 112 degree temperature water to work with. And they wanted to grow local food mostly for themselves and the community, so I talked them into doing a regenerative type greenhouse instead of just organic. And we put a hot water underneath the part of the floors. And so well, this is a second growing season, so we're ever learning and we'll be learning for a long time. But as far as the energy part is definitely meeting their um, goals for energy. It's got 20 big beds in there. Um, it's 96 foot long, so it's, it's not a tiny greenhouse. So I manage a small one and a giant one. Not a giant, but it's pretty big. So. Both like questions, so. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yes, I'm there with leaves. Oh, let me show your contact info oh, first. Yes. So if you need to get a hold of Patty. Here you go. Thanks, Mark. Hello, my name is Deborah Hines, and I'm a Montana native, and haven't spent a lot of time recently in, in Montana. I started out working in Kenya on a renewable energy project many years ago with very different types of technologies that we have today. But one of the things that has been consistent, whether I was working in Kenya or Tanzania or China, or most recently in Colombia, was the need for an integrated approach. In Colombia, and Colombia is where I would just like to share my um, latest project that I was working on, because it was very complex. This was in the northernmost tip of Colombia, a zone that was arid, looked like a desert. The predominant uh, source of income was from goats but people wanted to try to keep their ancestral cropping systems in place. So we started out by talking to people and trying to understand what those traditional cropping patterns were. What were their traditional crops? And what did they want to bring back into their cropping systems? And the main reason they wanted to do that is because over the years, because of the conflict, because of illegal economies, because of the deforestation, and because of climate change, they were no longer able to feed their families in the same way. This was evident because children were even dying of malnutrition, so they wanted to bring back their traditional cropping systems. So when we first started talking to people, and we made sure it was a cross-section of women, men, elders, young, adolescents, they said that we want practices that save water, build and conserve soils, diversify production to meet nutrition, as well as market demand, and then respond to the changing climate. And it's important to, to just say that this zone is affected by El Nino, La Nina, every climate pattern or every, every weather pattern that, that affects the Caribbean as well as the Pacific and the Atlantic. So when we started the discussion, they said it's very, very important that we recover traditional species and planting techniques. They'd already started a no-till with cover crops. We suggested introducing more trees because trees acted as a windbreak. They also uh, were nitrogen fixing and provided fruits or other medicinal um, things for, for families. And then again, intercropping with nitrogen fixing species. And this was very linked to reintroducing some of the bean species and um, squash species that they had traditionally planted. And then finally we said, well, this is great, but you've got a water problem. We're not really managing the water the way we need to here, so let's think about drip irrigation with renewable technologies. So, introduced um, a couple of technical experts. The collaboration, I should say that up front, was uh, funded by the US government, but it was with a consulting firm, technical firm, Tetra Tech, then the UN, 
communities, and regional governments. And we said, all right, if this is, this is how we're going to do it, collaboration is essential. And so then we went out and we got regional universities, we got um, the extension agents to all come and say, all right, we need to conduct an energy assessment and we need to conduct a water assessment before we can make any decisions on what kind of uh, renewable energy we want to incorporate. So it was very site-specific, context-specific, and we narrowed it down to solar photovoltaic panels. Um, we got rid of the windmills for one reason only, and that was because it was very difficult to maintain them with the high winds, and there just wasn't the capacity to maintain the windmills. And it was agreed that we would use bicycles. Bicycles with mechanical pumps for household consumption and water for animals. One of the other issues related to collaboration was to kind of undo 20 years of negativity against renewables. A new law was passed which finally said that off-grid communities could generate their own electricity, that they could share and even sell excess energy, and that um, each state would then have to develop the regulations. So part of the, the work was related to pushing local governments to set up the right regulations for sharing off-grid electricity. I already mentioned the importance of doing um, the energy potential analysis, but this, I just wanted to mention here that this was very, very site-specific, and we looked at costs and benefits, and the benefits were often very difficult to quantify. I'm an economist. By, by training, and so that's a lot of what we tried to do, saying, all right, we've got mitigation benefits, we've got adaptation benefits, um, there's gonna be less pollution if we're actually using groundwater, if we're not using chemical fertilizers, and so these were some of the benefits that we tried to quantify. We also said we need to develop local capacities not only to design the systems and implement the systems, but to do maintenance. We already had a conversation over the importance of maintenance. I mean, but some of the solar panels that we introduced have a 25-year lifespan, but we know that things are going to go wrong, especially in very harsh climates. And related to that was finding the best technical support, because there's a lot of companies out there that say, we can set up your systems, we can design your system. And so it took us quite a bit of time to come back and find the right company in the right area. I'll leave it there at the moment. Thank you. Uh, pass it on down to Tony at the end. Along with this. Everyone, thanks for coming out. Um, so my name is Tony Hartshorn. I teach here at Montana State. I try to teach, at least uh, my, my ninjas will tell you. Um, so I didn't put my phone number down, or even my email, because you just need to find my, what's my hashtag? Hashtag or pound sign soul culture if you're older. So I'm gonna try to teach you um, four numbers in four minutes. Um, they're the numbers. Uh, because I try to teach soils, I'm really interested in how do you take a measurement from one point in space and compare it to another measurement from another point in space. Um, and so that's what this is basically related to. So there's a lot of uh, excitement about soil health and carbon sequestration. This is just one example from this month. So you go to Bitly Meredith Ellis and she's now a rock star. Um, she's just a rancher, uh, but she's sequestering carbon. So I think it's really useful um, against that excitement to just remember some basics about carbon. So I'm really into trying to promote greater carbon literacy. And so this is the world's carbon budget. So the oceans release 80 gigatons of carbon every year and they also absorb 80 gigatons of carbon per year. Don't worry about the unit, right? I'm only gonna talk gigatons, it's a billion tons. It's a big number. 
So that's what's being shown right here on the left. If I had a pointer, I don't. So anyway, you can see there's an ocean. And this would have been all fine and well. So the ocean is recycling 80 gigatons out, 80 gigatons in. Land burps 120 gigatons every year of carbon, and it also pulls it in. That's called photosynthesis, right? So that's the global carbon budget. And of course, I left off this piece, which is what you know Dave started to talk about a little bit, and you know Deborah's talked about a little bit. Is you know we also have figured out how to take fossil sunshine, also known as fossil fuel, out of the ground and burn it to do good things, like this expo, right? And the problem—that's a really small arrow. That's only eight gigatons per year. And what's the problem? The problem is it's unbalanced. Right? We, we don't have anything that's pulling against that eight gigatons of carbon out. Thank you, fossil fuels, for making this expo possible. And so, as a consequence, if you look on the left of the screen, that's also known as the Keeling curve. So, just that really small arrow into the atmosphere from the oceans and the land and us burning fossil fuels, hello? Like, that's why CO2 is now something like 411 parts per million. Right, but it used to be 280 parts per million for thousands of years, right? And I would just say, do you guys all know what the fourth number is? Right, that's only three numbers, right? So the fourth number relates to how do we build carbon in the soil so that you guys can insert a number where that red arrow is? Because that's what I think of as arrow, is you want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. How big is that arrow? Can it get to eight gigatons of carbon per year? I mean, presumably that's what this panel will do. Though. That's all I got. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Robert? It's ready to go. Yeah. I guess it is. <clears throat> well, thanks, Tony. That was uh, good to see those numbers, you know, play out really well like that. Uh, my name is Robert Wood. Around in Montana, I grew up there, and I grew up with my grandparents uh, and my mother. My father was uh, died in World War II, and um, my grandfather and grandmother were both avid gardeners and fruit tree growers. So I grew up in a sort of a magical backyard of um, um, strawberries and crab apples and grapes. And Plums and uh, various, uh, you know, other things to eat, and um, it was um, uh, this was in the, in the 40s and 50s, and the World War II uh, kind of explosion of chemical, um, uh, petrochemical, actually. Um, Transferring from you know flying airplanes around and so on to um, you know, irrigation and pesticides and herbicides and that sort of thing happened uh, during during my youth. Um, my mother uh, remarried and uh, I you know changed changed houses and roundup and uh, um, we we grew a small garden but it wasn't anything. Uh, um, really to um, brag about. Um, then I went away to college and uh, then went away to San Francisco, a little more college, and uh, um, I was gone for seven years and came back in 1971. And um, right during the time when Montana was um, fairly politically progressive in many ways, we just, we were getting a new constitution uh, which guarantees helpful environment, you know, among other things. And um, there was at the same time happening uh, in, in eastern Montana and eastern Wyoming uh, this, um, it's called the North Central Power Study. It was a fossil fuel industry and government document which said we're going to make a sacrifice area of. Um, Eastern Montana, Eastern Wyoming, basically. They used that in the document. And um, one 
response to that was the creation of Northern Plains Resource Council, okay, which was comprised of a lot of local rancher and to some degree farmer groups that uh, resisted that scenario. And a couple of years, that was in 1972, and a couple of years later, some of us in Northern Plains decided that we wanted to say yes to something rather than no to something, so nine of us founded Arrow. And, uh, John Brown is here, and he's one of the founders, and I'm one of the founders. And Elizabeth, my partner in marriage, could not be here for this. And then there were um, you know, six, six other uh, people. And uh, we started out, Aero started out as, as basically just focusing on renewable energy and, and energy efficiency, and energy conservation. Um, Somewhat even at the end of the national level, when Jimmy Carter put some uh, solar collectors on the White House, Reagan was selected and he immediately took the solar collectors off the White House. And um, Arrow, it's, you, you know, we've been doing pretty well. We, um, uh, Elizabeth and I have been, uh, you know, gardening uh, in that same backyard I grew up in. For, for quite some time doing doing organic gardening, um, but um, um, it, you know, Arrow had had a bunch of members, farmers and ranchers, who wanted to get into low chemical or no chemical agriculture, and so um, Arrow grew its second wing and became a, a viable bird, um, renewable energy in one wing and, and um, um, sustainable agriculture in another wing. So, um, I just have just a couple more things to say. Uh, I've been organic gardening for quite a while, and um, I recently have come, become aware that um, organic gardening is basically leaving things out, chemical things and you know, poisons and stuff like that, of the equation. But, there's another factor, and that's the factor of the soil. And the soil is this amazing being that um, I just read that six billion microorganisms live in a teaspoonful of soil. I'm not sure who did the counting, but... Undergraduates. Uh, undergraduates, <laughs> yeah. They worked really hard. And uh, so, um, even my organic you know, my backyard gardening organic practices. Um, I, I used to dig up a lot. You know, I said, you know, I used to till the soil quite a bit. I've taken to try trying what's known now as kind of regenerative agriculture. It's kind of the next step beyond organic in a way, embodying organic. But and a lot of that, and you know, Patty and some other people can talk more about this. But um, a lot of that involves. Um, being careful with the soil, you know, and not just digging it up all the time because you're killing a bunch of my, those is, you know, beneficial microorganisms which do amazing magical things. And uh, so I've been trying to, you know, I planted potatoes this year and I just I dug individual holes for each potato. And, uh, you know, I'm sort of careful about if I have to dig a trench, I sort of kind of make it narrow beets and carrots and you know um, and because it, it makes sense to me you know that, that um, um, we need to uh, not just take care of the soil but you know love it to life so yeah thank you John uh, thanks <clears throat> my name is John Brown I uh, landed on the planet this time over at Circle um, and uh, spent a significant amount of my time there learning uh, how to hate agriculture as I was being exposed to it uh, and did that for a long time until I recognized I went away and found and also not only did I go away but I went to someplace it wasn't just going away from where I was born um, met, uh, found out that there were other ways of uh, possibly doing agriculture and I got intrigued and my dad died uh, in an opportune time for me and I was able to take over the farm 
at my uh, uh, the, at the uh, agreement of my mom and my other family members and uh, convert it into uh, an organic farm and uh, and became part of a, a organic certification program called Zarathustra's Garden and uh, we had to make up the rules because there weren't really any. Uh, we did some certification process, some guidelines on how to grow and, and accountability for that with a handful of us that were engaged in this. And uh, that went on for a while and it was really positive and one of the, one of the things that really came back to me this year was um, next to the last year that I was there, like in 78 or 9, I think, something like that, I planted um, all of the ground and we were doing uh, summer follow-up, so half of the ground was in crop and half of it was, was tilled. And uh, planted all of the things that were planted along with yellow sweet clover and, and that first year was a, because it's a, uh, a biennial. It was you know small and, and doing well, and it, I was really encouraged by all of the growth that I saw. And the next year, it was phenomenal. It was like driving across eastern Montana this year, where just yellow everywhere. And uh, I won't go into the experience of that, but I was reminded of that driving to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, um, this summer during the peak of. Uh, sweet clover season this year and I um, I wanted to come away from that trip with some kind of an idea or an I something to communicate with the rest of the people about what I was experiencing there were four of us in the car and uh, so we started a little project of, of what is there to learn on this trip and I did a little bit of research in how much sweet clover, how much nitrogen it would fix, and so it just took a square mile uh, <coughs> acres thing, and I don't remember the numbers right now, but uh, the not every acre on every side of the road was in sweet clover, but there was a significant amount of it, and in the 750 miles or something that we traveled, it was probably 500 miles that were just, just sweet clover as far as you could see. So we took a mile on each side of the road and used some rough estimates of how much nitrogen was being fixed by this sweet clover uh, growing alongside the road. And then in the corner of, of uh, northeast corner of Wyoming where our route took us, there was a new pipeline going in. It turns out there's a natural gas pipeline. 40 percent of natural gas is used to make nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, so I did a little bit of comparison of how much capacity would, does that pipeline of natural gas uh, carry to create nitrogen fertilizer and how much nitrogen fertilizer is being sequestered by this yellow sweet clover. It was a fun exercise. I have no idea whether it means anything to anybody or, or um, but I did write it up. Uh, it might be published by uh, the National Family Farm Coalition uh, <coughs> because that was the organization where we were going to participate in their annual meeting um, and a strategy meeting. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. It gave, and it reminded me of having that sweet clover uh, planted back, you know, 40 years ago. The cycles of my life seem to come around uh, as I've had. Some of them are long term. Uh, and, uh, but I wanted to just mention a little bit about um, tilling. And you know, I was tilling back then when I was farming, and I'm back with a different perspective now about tilling and exposing the Earth's uh, epithelial flare. Uh, and and we can't we we know erosion from the perspective of wind and water, but we don't know much about what happens when we expose 
soil before the wind and the water hit it. And I, I start thinking, started thinking about it as solar erosion, that these photons interrupt the biological processes so that if they, if that, if that solar erosion hadn't happened first, there wouldn't be wind and water erosion. And it was just, it was one of those things, I don't have any idea where any of this stuff goes, but it's just how we, how do we think about things? Um, and so when I, when I was able to take over the farm, I just wanted to say one more thing here and then I'll uh, let it evolve into, or devolve into whatever is next. But uh, when I had the opportunity to take over the farm at Circle, I decided rationally that I was going to uh, tr slowly transition into an organic farm and I was going to do it uh, maybe 15% a year or 10% a year. I don't remember the numbers exactly. So I you know, had a plan and I had, had the lambs broken out into how much was going to be what uh, the first year and I seeded and I got everything planted and then spraying season came around and I I couldn't do it. I couldn't separate myself into a chemical farmer and an organic farmer in, in, and, and I still don't know how people do that. I'm, I'm in awe of how they're able to maintain those two different perspectives because it was certainly different perspectives for me. And so I did what I call, uh, uh, I, I went cold turkey. <coughs> and which meant to me that I just quit all of the chemical things, all of the things that I recognized as addressing the enemy image with another war machine or product. But what I've come to find out, what I've just, just gotten a word for it here recently, or a term, uh, that alongside that cold turkey of what I'm doing without is a hot turkey, which is what happens in your community when you're doing something really, you're getting, you're on the fire, and, you know, on the, in, the, in the frying pan. When you take, uh, something that is outside of the community norms and uh, step out there. So one of the one of my neighbors, the word got back to me, back to that area before I did, when I was had made the decision to uh, go organic, and and I was I was absolutely terrified that I was going to be uh, my whole project was going to be de decimated by spray from my neighbors. Well, the other side of that was my neighbors were absolutely terrified that we were gonna, they were going to be decimated by my weeds. <clears throat> and it was, and I, I still haven't reconciled all of, all of that, um, but I'm starting to learn more about it, cycling around a little bit more. I'm really happy to be part of this panel and eager to see what emerges out of us sitting here in community uh, and more than just a bunch of individuals sitting uh, in individual chairs, but we're sitting in a circle of all of us. And uh, the NRCS agent up in Roundup, a um, guy named Austin Chiro, great guy, I love sitting down and talking with him. And we, when I first came back to Montana, we were talking about uh, spotted knapweed and got a little ways into that and he, he said, wait, stop. We have, to, we have to stop this conversation. He said, because we have to remember that plants de behave differently in community. And so I just want to say that each of us has our own little identity, but we behave differently in community if we want to. John. Okay, now we're going to start in with the, the Q&A, and, a, and uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to start this off, but again, uh, you and the audience are, are welcome to join this conversation as well. Uh, and I'm going to start with Dave, because energy efficiency and conservation is, is where we start. If you're 
talking about any sort of oh, can you hear me? Fine, okay. Um, where we start with, with any active um, renewable energy project um, on, a, on a farm or a ranch. So can you tell us what, what you're, you know, if you're invited in to do a consultation, what is your process and how how do you help farmers and ranchers increase their, their energy efficiency and, and conserve energy? And brought some dead air. So, well, the first thing I do when I when I do an energy audit, the first thing I do is I get historical energy use. So I look at the utility history um, and um, whatever fuel records uh, the farmer has and. Um, <clears throat> chart these things out, and engineers love charts, and I'm, I'm no exception. And uh, so I look at this history, and then from the history, I can tell um, what energy uses there are which are not related to weather, and, and I can uh, also identify uses of the energy that are related to weather. So that parses those things out. Then what I do is I go and I look at the energy end uses at the farm, and um, this is uh, counting light bulbs, for example, and right in here I've got some hellacious light bulbs um, to, to count. Um, trying to resist myself there, but um, so uh, well, yeah, yeah. This is, these are crazy. So. Um, so then I identify the end uses that are easy, that I can say, okay, this is how much of the energy use I can attribute to lighting. This is how much energy uh, I can attribute to heating. This is how much to cooling. Um, this is refrigeration. Okay, so I break out all these end uses. Then each little piece of energy each energy end use, then I say, okay, where's the low hanging fruit? What can we do that's cost effective to reduce the energy use on this farm? And um, that I start out with, where is the most energy going? Because usually, when you have the biggest piece of energy, if you can take a bite out of that big piece of energy, that's more than likely it's the uh, most cost effective. So. Um, these days, um, it's lighting. Um, I do uh, a lot of ventilation, and so uh, we've got the, the, the other. The other part is, is uh, the, to answer the question is, what can you do? So, there, if you see um, an end use that, where the energy use is high, then you say, okay, what could the alternative be? And, um, these days, uh, for example, in lighting, we have very nice technologies that are very energy efficient. Um, I, have, I go to farms and I see technology in, in use uh, that is literally 100 years old. Um, I see a lot of technology that's 60 years old. And people are using these technologies to this day. And uh, when they go to the store to replace a piece of lighting equipment, they replace it with a piece of technology that's still 60 years old. Um, so instead, what I do is I say, okay, now here's a new technology, and we put this in, and then I calculate the uh, economics. So most of my work is not engineering, but it's economics. And so I just say, okay, here's the economics of uh, replacing this piece of equipment with this piece of equipment. We're going to take this fan out, we're going to put this fan in, it's going to save this much energy and therefore this much money, costs this much money, okay? saves this much in maintenance. Um, there may be other monetized benefits. Um, the, the kicker is non-monetized benefits, which are externalities, uh, which I say, well, it has other benefits that we can't put a dollar value on, those are very annoying, um, 
But I always tell the farmer, I say, okay, this is going to help this. And um, so basically work out all the economics on the uh, equipment that can be replaced um, and then come up with uh, a project that they can um, proceed with. Now, these projects that I work with are all very incremental. And I always tell people, I say, you don't have to do it all at once. Do what you're comfortable with. And you say, well, I can do a four-year payback. I say, well, this is what we can replace with four-year payback. Okay? I say, I need a one-year payback. I say, well, this is what we can do with a one-year payback. So it's very incremental. You can, you can take as much or as little as you want. Uh, and I, I'm kind of annoyed by people that say, we have to get every last kilowatt hour. We have to get every last third of energy. And I say, well, then people just don't want to afford to do that, okay? Maybe the payback on some of that stuff is 20 years out. Yeah, you can say, well, it's going to pay for itself. It's going to live more than 20 years. It's very expensive, and it's hard for, it's hard for people to... Take. So I just say, let's just do the incremental stuff and be comfortable with that. And as soon as people get comfortable with the uh, technologies, which some of these technologies are brand new, and they're very good technologies. We're, we're, we're at the point now where the same thing that's happening with energy efficient technologies, which has happened with computer technologies. We all recognize how fast computer technologies are advancing. And everyone is just like, oh, a new iPhone, okay? It's only $1,000. Well, the, these energy efficient technologies are doing the same thing. And in fact, a lot of them are the same technologies. Computer equipment is also used for controls, okay? So you remember one of my slides was we can put in more efficient equipment, okay? And that's buying more efficient equipment that uses less power. Okay, but the other thing we can do is we can cut down the number of hours we use that equipment. Okay? Cutting down the hours that we use that equipment, that's controls. And controls is the same technology that we use for computers and iPhones and all this stuff that we enjoy so much. Okay? So this is new technology, the cost is much less now, and the quality is very good. And so things that we were doing even two and three years ago as standard practice, nowadays we can uh, put better controls on, we can uh, put more efficient equipment in and cut that energy use significantly and have non-energy benefits. Okay? Better lighting, better quality and color, better quality and color rendition, better ventilation, these things make our, the animals are happier. I'm talking, maybe we're talking about a dairy. So uh, if cows are happier, they get more milk, right? So we improve the control system, we improve the lighting, we improve the ventilation, we get more production. I think I went too much. No, that's wonderful. Oh, I can go more. <laughs> so, um, so another way I think to, to reduce your energy use is just to use the flux of, of heat from the earth or the flux of solar energy that, that's coming down. And there are Okay, can, you guys can hear me? Good. Um, so another thing we can do then is, um, ex, ex, or we have folks here that have experience with um, passive or geothermal greenhouses, for instance. And so I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about that. Um, maybe starting with John, because um, over 40 years ago, you built, with help from Aero folks, a, a passive greenhouse. And I, I wonder, um, can you tell us about that and uh, how well it worked out for you? Yeah, I can talk about that. Uh, in the context of what I what I know today, I, it was a, it was a good experience and a good experiment, uh, and it didn't do what we hoped it would do, which was 
uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one was because it it didn't uh, it didn't provide the uh, temperature swings that we were hoping for, or the lack of swings. Uh, it got cold. Uh, we had the heat down okay. We could we could take care of that, but it, it got too cold in there, uh, and uh, and that was. Um, thermal mass wasn't, we weren't as good at, uh, at uh, managing that as we would like to have been, um, but we were learning. And, and one of the good things about what Montana did in the 70s was establish a cold severance stat, uh, trust fund. And that money, uh, some quite a bit of it went to renewable projects, exploration, you know, tests, just experiments, see what would work. Some of them did, some of them didn't. And in many ways, uh, ours did. But what happened last year was that I got to visit a greenhouse down in uh, Alliance, Nebraska, just outside of Alliance, Nebraska, that was started by a guy named Russ Finch. Uh, as a retired postal worker, and he has been using low-grade geothermal that he and, and his wife were told for years and years would not work. And he got kept asking, kept asking, kept asking, and the, all of the experts kept saying, you, this won't work. And so his wife finally told him, Russ, if we're going to do this, we got to do it on our own. And so they did, and they built a house that had this uh, low-grade, geothermal uh, heat to uh, eight feet down in the ground uh, that heated a uh, solarium in their house. And it worked so well that they decided they were gonna build a greenhouse. And they built a greenhouse, this was 25 years ago. And that one is still grow still going, still growing. The uh, redwood structure in it uh, rotted away, so they had it replaced it with metal structure but it's basically the same thing. It's an earth sheltered passive solar greenhouse that uses uh, low-grade geothermal, costs them less than a dollar a day to, to maintain a Mediterranean uh, environment. They have a 24, 25 year old Meyer lemon in there. It's one of their, one of their favorites. And they get 125, 150 pounds of Meyer lemons a year off of this, this tree. Um, and it's a, and when I visited that last year, I said, "Oh my God, that's what we missed. That's what we didn't have available to us at that time, or right? what well, we weren't aware of." It. Jim Burke uh, helped design and build the structure along with uh, Wilbur's brother Marty and his wife Jan and uh, Randy Reinhardt and a few others that were involved in the in the construction of of that system. And so now I'm really excited about uh, creating a, a community of people who are interested in growing their own food because that was the other thing that was missing and I'll talk about that tomorrow um, more, the, the social structure of running something like that because if you're doing a greenhouse, a year-round greenhouse, it's like having a dozen milk cows. You gotta show up every day <clears throat> and and everyone knows who has anything connected with, with dairies and milk cows is that you don't have a life outside of that. That's it. And nobody wants to have that kind of thing, but we think that's what's necessary, and it is. If we're doing it uh, at, you know, as a Lone Ranger. But the social structure and the economic structure of co-ops was not developed to the extent that it is now. And I think that's the other piece that will make local year-round nutrient-dense uh, and diverse food available in this climate. And, uh, and the other piece is the uh, moving from a monoculture flat line, which is what we were looking at in Circle, the greenhouse there to a, tree, to a food forest inside. So uh, a Mediterranean food forest in uh, central Montana is something that I, I'm pretty excited about. I, I'm, uh, I'm reminded of Joel Ostanowski, who's in 
uh, basalt Colorado and high elevation, cold temperatures. Yep. And he's doing something similar with what he calls the, the climate battery, where he's pumping warm, moist air into the ground during the summer and then reaping the value of that heat during the, the winter time. And, and Patty, you've also had experience both with passive and, uh, and geothermal, uh, geothermal active greenhouse. Could you tell us about that experience and, and, and maybe what you would suggest for somebody who's just starting out uh, who wants to, to uh, have a season extended greenhouse? Well, how would you recommend they start? Well, the very first thing I'd start with is with your goals, right? So the goals have got to be exactly what you're wanting to do. For example, this passive solar that we're looking at here, the goal was not to be year-round. I mean, this it's at a school, and we knew we didn't have enough daylight hours. We're almost on a 49th parallel. We didn't have enough daylight hours to be able to be growing in December and January, so we didn't. We was not attempting to do so. Right? Our, our goal was to extend it so that we could be growing stuff in April and harvest it in May for the kids before they get out of school, and then be able to grow all the way until Thanksgiving in the fall. So this passive solar does that, so it is not capable of being year-round without doing something more to it. It, it is on a six-inch, um, six-foot deep foundation, so it's built just like a house. Um, insulated ICFs in it, and it's built identical to a house other than it's got 20 inch um, stem walls instead of the 16s. And its back wall is uh, 20 water barrels. So the key to these passive solars is to be able to have the energy be able to heat, hit the heat sink. So if you get it too wide, the dimensions of it is super important. So if it was wider, it would not work. If it was narrower, it's not going to work. Um, people try to convince me well, it's going to be too hot to grow in there in the summertime. So the first two years, we didn't even attempt to grow in there in the summertime. And so I was in there around the 4th of July, and I thought, it's cooler in here, and it is out there, and the sun is in Alaska. Well, we're going to grow in here <laughs> next year. So we started growing in there and have had the best uh, produce, best everything inside there, growing in, in the summer inside that greenhouse. So, um, just kind of keep track of your goals and have a good idea of what you're trying to do. The, the one is the Sleeping Buffalo Greenhouse. Uh, this is big, it's 30 by 96. That's a poor picture, but I did want to show that they, they, they wanted to have it, have it be as, as solid a building as they could, so that's why they built these permanent end walls. And I've got um, greenhouse type shut ground gutters or whatever levers on it. So their, their big problem was the soil. They didn't have any soil, right? And in eastern Montana, if you disturb the soil, you're going to have bindweed. And I don't know where the bindweed seed come from, but it's in, I think, probably every gram of soil. So if you disturb it, you're going to get bindweed. So I told them, I says, well, we'll just build our beds on top of it. And they was, uh, when I met these people, they were about ready to go buy pallets of miracle Grow. And I'm like, uh, no. We're not going to do that. I'm like, let's use our resources on our place. And they're like, well, what resources would they be? And there was a truck wash station at this um, hot spring where they'd wash out tractors, uh, loads of cattle, year after year after year after year, for decades. And then this pile of manure is there, a rotten manure. And they had also cattail tailings of where this hot water comes out of this greenhouse, or out of the hot springs. And those cattails decompose over time. It was hundreds of years of decomposing cattails there. And so we gathered those up in the, in the manure. And they have, uh, in eastern Montana, wood chips are available from your electric company because they chip the lines. But then they're, then instantly become a problem for them because now they've got to truck them back to a landfill to get rid of them. So I told them to intercept them so that every time we turn around, there's a new truckload behind this greenhouse of wood chips. And then we just let them age and let the fun guy grow in them. So we mix those to be able to make their soil. So they made their own soil to alleviate that problem of soil. 
And what are the what's temperature of the beds? The beds uh, depends on the temperature of the day and the sunlight. Um, but I would say close to 80 degrees. And they put uh, worms, red wiggler worms, in every bed. And then I had them mulch the beds with wood chips. So we were following regenerative agricultural practices just indoors instead of outdoors. And so those worms were actively decomposing in there and stuff. And so I, I think they actually are just growing in worm castings is what we're growing in <laughs> for soil. I could go out all, all day, but I won't. Too. In, in a previous life, I was a geologist, and I was very interested to think that there would be a hot spring in, in north central Montana, and it turns out that it really wasn't. No, so. no, it's not a spring. It is a, it's a well. It's a deep well. And so they were, I don't know if they were um, drilling for gas, gasoline, uh, gas, uh, natural gas, I think. We're, we're just really close to the natural gas field, and so they hit this gusher of hot water instead of gas. And so. Deborah, you've been involved with lots of projects in the developing world where I think cost and return on investment, everything was a critical component. And I'm sure you have learnings for, for us where, where we, we may also be capital constrained. Um, whether it's in these passive technologies or active clean energy, do you have some thoughts about what we should be looking to? Tough question. But I think I would start where Patty started, which is what are the objectives? What do you really want to accomplish? And if I go back to the Columbia example, what we said was our objective was to improve food production on farm, to increase the diversity and the nutrition of the food produced, produce nutrient-dense foods. And so with that objective, we had to start with some criteria. One was size of the farm. You have to say, unfortunately, if you're below more or less two hectares, so it's about five acres, um, we couldn't include you in the project. There would be other options, other activities, but for solar, for the photovoltaics, we had to have at least a minimum productive potential from, from the area. Another important factor was deciding was there the technical expertise to be able to design and maintain the system. I mean, sustainability is a huge issue when, when you start to make these kinds of investments. So we had to say, in some areas that were too isolated, we're talking about all off-grid areas to begin with, and so then they even have degrees of isolation. And so some areas we just had to exclude because they were too far from the right technical support and even getting the maintenance and the, the replacement parts that you need when, um, when something does go wrong. I think we were also trying to say that, um, as I mentioned before, that there are a lot of upfront costs that were offset by basically a subsidy from, from the project. There are subsidies that are sometimes made available to, to farms in the U.S. We know that um, large monocultures tend to be the norm for farm subsidies. I think it, was, it came out in our discussion earlier today that when you start talking about um, organics, fruits, vegetables, there are really no subsidies available. And so this was one area that we really tried to put some pressure on local governments to say, need to get some support for, for these smallholder farmers. I think when we talk about also the benefits, I, I mentioned before that there were a lot of economic benefits that are important to consider, but for the farmer themselves, they weren't very interested in the conservation of water off farm or the lack of pollution. But, so we had to show them that if you weren't applying any fertilizer, you had a big savings. If you weren't having to carry water or truck in water, there was a big savings. And so these were the types of costs that um, we, we analyzed. 
And then finally, in terms of costs and benefits, it, it's, a, it's a decision that, is there ultimately a market linked to what you're trying to produce? And so we included later uh, a marketing component within the project, and it was very similar again to what, what Patty mentioned, farm to school. Schools were um, an incredibly important market for any excess production. So I think we probably should have thought about the marketing component earlier on, and that would be one recommendation is, especially when we start talking about the organics, fruits and vegetables, what are, what are the markets, um, are we caught competitive in terms of what we're trying to produce and are, is the demand really stable? Ever. So at, at this point, I think we'd like to, to turn from these technologies and techniques that can help reduce the contribution of agriculture to um, contributing to uh, atmospheric carbon and other greenhouse gases and start talking about what can we do as stewards of the soil to possibly draw down atmospheric carbon and, and so maybe let's start with Tony, who, who has uh, a really great background in soil science. And tell us what is the real potential there? Okay, so I might have a background in soils, but I'm no Sasha. You raise your hand, Sasha, because Sasha is a producer. And so he actually knows how to grow food. So the trick, right, is I might know something about soils, but I know nothing about growing food or cow or lentil or anything like that. Um, if uh, you can advance to the arrows, um, again, I think that was at the end of my slide um, deck, right? So that's, that's good. Um, the big deal is we can't really say we understand the carbon cycle, even though I've given it to you in five arrows, until we understand why we're not up to our necks in charcoal, right? And that's not my line, it's from a colleague of mine. We don't really understand the carbon cycle. And even when people, like, you can open these magazines and say, ooh, diamonds are forever. Actually, they're not, right? Our whole world would be full of diamonds, right? Hello, right? Even they go through a process of rot and sort of back to the elemental, you know, the elements that they're made of. So the big deal is, um, I guess if we advance one more, a couple more, there is an arrow down. And that arrow down is essentially asking the question, what are some management strategies, right, that can help us on a net basis pull more CO2 out of the air through photosynthesis and then quote unquote sequester it in the soils? I mean. I don't want to rain on the parade here, but it turns out that carbon doesn't last in the soils forever because the, you know, Wilbur's talking about love your soil to life. I mean, what he's really saying is feed your microbes food. And you don't need to do that. Plant roots do that. But all of that carbon is that big 120, gig it's part of that big 120 gigatons of carbon that is lost from soils every year, right? So just to put things into perspective here, um, the things that I'm most excited about, because we're Montana, um, I think we should be following the water. Um, I mean, great book called Beyond the 100th Meridian, Course of Climate Change, now it's the 98th Meridian, but anyway, so like, Wallace Stegner has a chapter in there called Blueprint for Dryland Democracy. That's what needs to be going down in Montana because we're gonna have shrinking snowpacks. I think that's pretty crystal clear. We're gonna have increased water demand for our Missouri and Yellowstone River acre feet that flow to the Midwest. Guess who's caught in between? Montana producers, okay? So they're gonna have to grow more food somehow, some way with less water. That's an interesting trick. So some of what I've been doing is thinking about with producers, because again, I can't grow anything. What are the tricks? for maybe making your soils a little tiny bit wetter? Are you capturing snow, for example? Are you accelerating snow melt into the ground versus letting it just sublimate right back to the atmosphere? That's a trick. Um, and I'll leave it at that. So, Wilbur, let's 
Let's go to you next because you wrote an article that recently appeared in the Nation about people who are carbon farming and trying to uh, sequester carbon in the soil. One of those people that you mentioned in the book is John Brown, who's also here. And I just wonder, what did you learn when you were writing that article? And, and do you have hope for that uh, to be something of value? Well, um, there's more water in the air now because it's, you know, we're heating up. So, um, one of the things, that if you're sequestering carbon in the soil, you're also sequestering water. I don't know if the water goes away as fast as the carbon. Hard to say. Do you know anything about that? Well, you can evaporate water out of soils on a sunny day, but it's going to take a long time to lose soil organic matter and have it be respired out as CO2. Yes. If, if the soils are covered, you know, in plants, is that that's going to take even more to... Absolutely. Yeah, okay. So it's part of the reason that this kind of notion of regenerative agriculture um, that's the answer to the question, but um, we, we should um, probably try to keep our soil covered as much as we can, you know, uh, and um, do companion planting and, and uh, plant, you know, two, two crops at the same time, one, you know, matures earlier and then one later, that, that kind of thing. And it's, uh, and a lot of, a lot of uh, farmers are beginning to, to do that, they're, they're already doing it. Oh, what else is there? Soil structure. Um, one thing that can needs to happen, I guess, is uh, to get better water infiltration. Right now in eastern Montana, where we've been doing no-till for about 20, 30 years, or at least for sure 30 years, 40 years on my family farm in Michigan, whatever depth that tool um, cedar is set at, there, that's created a hard pan on the soil. Right, so now the soil, if it rains, goes through that first four inches, if it's only set four inches deep. That's, that's the only place the water, the air, and the, the, the soil life is actually functioning, because the hard pan stops it. So the, then the hard pan creates water to run off, and, and we're not getting these cycles to work properly. So I think um, if we start understanding more about our, our soil structure, the soil microbes are building that structure, and get more water infiltration into the soil. So if it, water falls on your land, you keep it. As in eastern Montana, we're having horrendous runoffs. Uh, at every rain event now is runoff that's causing floods. And now even landslides are starting to take place because the soil is not able to hold the water that actually is coming. Um, if, if I could just interject. Okay, so one of the things that I do is irrigation uh, efficiency. And um, without exception, every irrigation system that I have looked at um, puts more water on than the soil requires. Okay. And so either the water runs off and it takes with it the fertilizer and, and other chemicals, of course, that the farmer is paid for, and um, or the water goes through the, the plant root zone into what's called deep percolation. Okay, so the farmer is paid for that water. The water is lost to deep percolation or runoff, and uh, so that it causes much more problems. Uh, so it's really important to me to make sure that we get just the right amount of water to benefit the plants and not too much water. And that's why we want to continue to promote drip irrigation because drip irrigation has much less trans evaporation and you can control, especially with the technology that we have today, the amount that goes on. Yeah, um, the systems that I work with are, are center pivot irrigation systems. So, so um, I guess 
where, um, where I start usually is uh, even with flood irrigation. And uh, then we have gated pipe irrigation, uh, wheel lines and all this, you know, impact sprinklers. And so um, kind of the realm where I work is to get them to go from like an impact sprinkler irrigation system to a pivot irrigation system where there's drops, which is much more efficient. Um, and uh, sub-irrigation and, and drip irrigation um, on some of these fields, uh, yeah, we'd have to look at the capital cost for installing those systems. And, yeah, the farmer would you know, just say, yeah, it's something that I'm very interested in, and, and we do see, definitely see drip irrigation in some of these big gardens, you know, for sure. You know, I'm going to just jump in here a little bit on water. And when we look at microorganisms as a, as a, a uh, com component, a contributor to uh, water holding capacity, but I want to look at just once, we just bring out but I, something that I learned in, recently. Um, more specifically, and that is what happened to the beaver population as uh, as colonialization took place in this country. And supposedly there were 400 million beaver on the uh, continent at uh, pre uh, colonization, and uh, dropped that down to four million or something like that. And what happened to the water cycle as those uh, engineers, hydrological engineers, uh, were eliminated from the landscape because there were, it was supposed to have been you know, every two miles uh, there was a place to water when in the early days and even this country and now you got to go 20 miles or 50 miles or whatever it is and a lot of that was, was because of the beaver as a keystone species for man water management. And so part of it, you know, we look at how do we sequester water on the micro level, but we can also look at it on the meso level, where there are other, other living, living beings that contribute to, to this. And when a beaver come back, then a cottonwoods come back, and willows come back, and changes in the, uh, in the, in the riparian zones happen. And, uh, so there, there are other things that are, uh, that are Part of part of this are really pretty exciting, and we can go out and and pretend we're beavers in in some ways and build an environment where they will come back if we allow them to come back, and and then we're then we're you know doing something significant, uh, and when you have those riparian zones holding water, that water goes up the hillsides, and then the the plant species. From between where the water is and the riparian zone starts changing, and it's a cascading uh, uh, effect, a positive uh, cascading effect, where we're bringing that water out of the atmosphere that we've lost and, and putting it close to the surface and even deeper into the surface, and so springs start opening up, um, all kinds of really wonderful things that can, can happen. Uh, so, yeah. Tony, um, we talked a little bit about a number of startup companies that are looking to compensate, I think especially ranchers, for incorporating practices that might build soil carbon and, um, and again, draw down atmospheric carbon. And I think there's some challenges associated with that, um, which you kind of alluded to the fact that maybe that carbon's not there forever. Um, but I just wondered if you could kind of share your perspective on, on those schemes, and is this something really that could be a potential income stream for, for ranchers? Yeah, can I drive it with a slide? Um, so I was, uh, I partnered with a group called Native Energy uh, last summer. Let's see if this works. Uh, maybe. Um, and I'll just skip to the native energy slide, um, if I can get there. I, I might be a little bit closer to the signal. 
you know, maybe I need you to just advance to the one that's got the native energy numbers on it. Um, so the native energy is just a group based out of the uh, on the East Coast, but they partnered with many ranchers uh, across Montana. And apologies for all of this extra stuff, but so maybe the next slide would be great. So just in a nutshell, what they're looking at is this idea. This is model space, but. You know, we're going to have 150,000 acres across Montana. Maybe we'll be able to sequester 45,000 tons of carbon per year. And so, you know, the idea is that it's some, let's say, the social cost of carbon is about a, you know, thirty dollars per ton or something like that. There's some notion that at some point, um, as you build carbon in your soils by increasing organic matter, then those producers would be compensated for the gain, right? So for the carbon, the CO2 that's been sucked down through a leaf and then released down into the root zone. So if we go maybe one more slide, um, I'm sorry, go back to the um, white oak pastures. That's a really nice graph. So it's back a couple slides, sorry for this. But um, what white oak pastures out of Georgia has been showing is they basically have, are looking at how many years of regenerative grazing does it take to build carbon at a certain rate, right? So they're trying to compensate. And then, but again, just to emphasize, they're in Georgia. And so speaking with them, this is a great one. So what you're looking at on the x-axis here is years over which that soil has been regeneratively grazed. Um, so, you know, these are new data. It's not even up on the website for white oak pastures. But the idea is, hey, we just moved you into regenerative grazing. That would be the zero year, right, near the origin on the left side of this graph. And then some of their uh, paddocks have been grazed for 20 years. And then all you do is you measure in whatever your favorite units are. Mine are grams, which is about a jumbo paperclip per cubic foot, because I can actually see that. I can visualize that. I have no idea what those units mean, megagram of carbon per hectare. And of course, that's really misleading, because unless you speak metric and understand that areas don't weigh anything, what they really mean is you know, how many metric tons of carbon are in a box that's one hectare, that's two and a half acres, to one meter, which is about 40 inches, right? So soils come in boxes. The big deal here, to your question mark, is that you know they fit this nice line to it. That's what scientists do, because we do love our charts, Dave. And they're like, hey, check it out. It's 2.3 megagrams, again, metric tons of carbon per hectare to one meter depth per year. But that's six grams of carbon per cubic foot. That's my favorite unit per year. Is it fair to put a straight line to that? Absolutely not. You, you could see that a better fit would be for it to bend over. Are you with me? And just sort of start leveling out. Where that level out point is, I don't think anybody knows for Montana. So there are companies right now like Native Energy trying to get in on the ground floor and figure out what's our baseline number. What do we understand about Montana, how much carbon is in Montana soils and how much extra can we fit in there? And there's a, there's a fair body of literature that says we've lost half the carbon from our northern Great Plains prairie soils. Thank you, plow. Right, because that tillage in 100 years has really led to the vast losses of carbon. So there's some idea that we might be able to rebuild that. Does that help? It, it really does, yeah. And, and so there are companies that are, like, like we've been talking about, that have schemes to, to reward farmers and ranchers for uh, actual major decreases in the carbon in their soil. So I, th I think that's encouraging. Um, and certainly our, our farmers and ranchers need an industry. So we're, we're almost out of time, um, but what I'd like to do now is kind of outsource uh, my compilation of takeaways from this by asking each of our panelists, uh, what, what's the biggest takeaway they have from this discussion today? Um, if there's something new you've learned or if, uh, if there's something that you think the audience ought to take away as, as the most important thing from, from this discussion. I'll start with Pat. Ah, sorry. Uh, well, when it comes to soil life, I guess um, the best thing to do is to understand how some of the practices you've been doing is harming. So 
some of our best um, solution is to stop doing some of the things we've been doing. Especially when it comes to nitrogen. We haven't talked about the nitrogen cycle yet. I don't have time for that, but uh, the microbes can do that part for us, so let's let them do some of the work. We've heard this morning and, and on this panel that we have to act now. Climate change is a factor, but yet we do have solutions, we do have technologies. And so the question is, how do we find the right technology, the right solution to act quickly? Um, yeah, what are the right solutions? And maybe they are not in the places we're actually looking. Uh, Gabe Brown talks about um, compaction, and he was talking about four inches down there, this massive compaction zone that keeps everything from uh, <clears throat> going down deep. And Gabe says the biggest compaction zone that, that he is aware of is the one between our ears. So uh, <laughs> that, that one is uh, one that I think we haven't looked very closely at. Uh, how's the capacity? Um, uh, talking on this panel is a lot of fun, and, and what, it's always amazing to me, to myself, how how I get the blinders on, and it's like I'm focused on you know, things that I do and and my work, and I, I just I very rarely get input from other people and so I, I think to to get to sit on a panel like this and, and get forced into listening to these other people that talk about things from their perspective is so different from mine and it's so it's so fun to, to actually it's like oh wow there's some different ways of thinking and there's uh, some something new that where I can look at something differently and so that's I really appreciate that. And I'm interested in the possibilities of a rural repopulation. Um, I have some more to say about that in a minute. But, um, you know, it, a lot of this is work that can be done uh, on farms and even, even ranches to, to an extent where. Um, the hired hands are gone, basically. You know, I mean, it's kind of like you're running your own show, and maybe you got some big machinery to run it, and it costs a lot of oil and all that. But um, you know, when I was growing up, farms were places around my town, anyway, where you know the farmers would bring in eggs or milk or you know. So a lot of the kind of just the food distribution aspect of this um, could, could change in, in a way if, if um, more people are back to the land, tending the soil, trying to put, um, you know, more carbon in the ground basically and keep it there as long as possible. Um, I don't know. Uh, it, it would be um, I think it would be good if we had more people on the land. I'm not sure that my daughter's generation, or you know, if I had a granddaughter, her generation, I don't, but um, are all that interested in not being in cities, you know, not not having that cultural activity. But on the other hand, you know, a, a lot of a lot of young people are interested in getting out into nature and. Maybe they could be interested in getting out into nature to do some actual work, not just re recreating, I guess to say. Um, and I'm, I'm not speaking in any way to d diminish um, generations that came behind me. Uh, they, they know a lot. And uh, I think what they kind of need to investigate is where can they do some really good work? And I think a lot of the good work has to be on the land. 
Oh, I second that, all for the land. I'm a landographer. Can you go to my arrows again? So my takeaway here, the session was called Energy and Carbon on Farm. And so, I, oh, that's a good one. So I would just encourage all of you, even if you're indirectly connected to ag because you're eating food, or if you're directly connected to ag, like understand a little bit about how much energy is coming into your property, right? Or think about the energy behind your lifestyles. Uh, I have a really simple way of thinking about energy. Either you're fresh or you're fossil. But most of my students have no clue what I'm talking about when I'm like, do you understand the term fossil fuel? That's really awkward for me, right? So fossil fuel, if you measured the radioactivity of fossil fuel, like out of my Subaru, it's not radioactive because it was photosynthesized 200 million years ago. All the radiocarbon is gone. So what you want is fresh fuel. And that actually applies to the carbon too. It'd be nice if we could all do shorter looping carbon, short lived carbon. Um, so if you're not carbon literate, get carbon literate. If you're not metal literate, what we haven't talked about is every wind turbine that's going up requires four tons of copper. Whose backyard is that coming out of? Oh, PV, same thing, holes in the ground. My phone requires 60 holes in the ground for the 60 elements in just my smartphone. I'm not sure we're really metal literate. I'm not sure we're as carbon literate. I'm certainly not super literate in either one of them, but I try to coach my students to be slightly more literate, and hopefully this session has helped in that regard. All right. Well, this has been a wonderful session. I've really enjoy enjoyed the conversation. I wish we could spend another hour and a half or another couple days talking about these uh, issues. And uh, But I'd like to have a round of applause for our wonderful panel. Uh, and so happy to have a 